just the the pressure of succeeding right um the, the general pressure of succeeding because um you know you have this ambition um that you what you really want out of life but there's also the fear there at the back of your mind that it's possible it will not happen because you would see many people who would have um they would have wanted to be footballers as well and it didn't happen for them so in a way as well i use that fear as a motivational factor so it motivated me to work even harder to ensure that i was able to achieve what i wanted to achieve um it's almost um it gave you that mental toughness you know working hard gives you that mental toughness to succeed and once you work hard i firmly believe that you're going to get your rewards the var show the one place for your weekly football update Hola, very warm welcome to the VAR show, the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to continue the of interviews and we have former Dundee and Trinidad and Tobago goalkeeper Mr. Kelvin Jack with us. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Kelvin for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show and I would like to begin by asking you how are you and what are you doing these days? Um yeah, I'm fine so far. Um you know, obviously trying to stay safe because there's a global pandemic going on. Um but I'm also busy you know doing a quite a bit of coaching um with an academy that I I coach here in the southeast of England and also a professional club here in England that play in the national league. Um you know, I'm I'm doing their goalkeepers and and stuff. So yeah, I'm I'm quite busy. Of course and like uh, how difficult was was it strange for you like you know the past maybe 6 months you know like way the pandemic it was a catastrophe for everyone but uh, as a as a play, as someone who's very uh, very much related to football you know on day to day basis how difficult was it for you um it, it was a challenge it was certainly different um you know it was also quite a a good time to to spend with with the family of course um but it, it it you know it was a challenge for me just like it was a challenge for everyone else um you know there was a lot of uncertainty of course um with what's happening when this is going to you know start getting better um you know when you know covid-19 is going to start really um going away but um i used the time to spend with family also uh, my two boys they play football as well so it was a lot of time to you know to do a lot of technical work with them and you know we got a lot of technical work in um during the lockdown period of course and i wanted to ask you like you said like you work with the with uh, with your with your academy and also with the uh, clubs right now how is the response especially with the academy how is the response you know of the parents are they more open to sending the kids out because because they know like uh, there is a pandemic going all, uh, around the world so are they open or is there uh, a decreased amount of people who are coming to the academy um well there are guidelines in place um for instance if anyone is feeling unwell um if you've got a temperature if you've got a dry cough um and what if you have lost your, your sense of taste and what have you you're not allowed to to participate in the training session it's been a challenge of course and there are certain protocols in place for the kids um when they come into train um and and the professional club as well um you know temperatures are checked um you know you are how you feeling if you have any if you're feeling unwell at all you're not allowed to participate um so there are things in place to to try to keep everyone as safe as possible but as we know um nothing is 100% safe of course and you know like uh, it's a global challenge and you know like I'll talk of your career as usual like you know you I think you were doing your college you were in your college in Arizona and simultaneously playing too did you always plan on becoming a football player or was it something that happened um it was always my plan to be a footballer you know from since the age of 9 10 um i wanted to be a footballer um you know a lot of people in trinidad they 
you know, they, they told me that, no, that's never going to happen because, of course, Trinidad is a small country and, um, you know, there was no professional league there at the time. Um, but, you know, I, I, was, um, I was steadfast in my belief that uh, I'm going to be a footballer. Um, I worked very, very hard um, because I knew it was going to be very difficult just due to the fact that, you know, I, I was not born in Europe or, or, or anything like that. So I was aware that it was going to be hard. So that's why I, I totally dedicated myself to the game um, to achieve my goals. Of course, Anil, like, I wanted to ask, like, what was the most difficult thing that you faced, you know, like on your journey maybe to becoming a, uh, uh, a football player? Um, the most difficult journey is, I, I would say, is um, just the, the pressure of succeeding, right? Um, the, the general pressure of succeeding because... Um, you know, you have this ambition um, that you what you really want out of life, but there's also the fear there at the back of your mind that it's possible it will not happen because you would see many people who would have, um, they would have wanted to be footballers as well and it didn't happen for them. So in a way as well, I use that fear as a motivational factor. So it motivated me to work even harder to ensure that I was able to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Um, it almost, um, it gave you that mental toughness. You know, working hard gives you that mental toughness to succeed. And once you work hard, I firmly believe that you're going to get your rewards. Of course, and you're like, uh, you have a lot of like, you had, maybe you had like that, uh, uh, another, like you had Dwight York also who had, you know, like maybe uh, traveled similar path coming from where you are. And but uh, the, the the fact with you is you are a goalkeeper. So there's only one goalkeeper that can play per team. So you would have faced a lot of, even if you, if, if you, even if you had given like maybe 100 percent, maybe there were weeks or teams where you did not play. So how do you prepare yourself for that? Um. Again, I, you know, I, I have to stress on it. And um, it's, it's something I always tell players I work with, goalkeepers that I work with, that you've got to dedicate yourself to the game. And if you, ded if you dedicate yourself to the game, I believe that you have a, a really good chance of success if you, ded if, you, if you dedicate yourself to the game. But you must dedicate yourself to the game. Um, yes, it's one spot. It's one spot as a goalkeeper. And that's even more motivation to work harder. You know, that's even more motivation to work harder and to, and, and, and to be committed to be able to be that one player who's going to be chosen, that one goalkeeper who the coach is going to choose to be, you know, to be in goal. So, um, yes, you know, I was aware that it's one position and it's going to be tough, but that's the reason why you put the work in to make sure that you show the coach that, listen, there is one position and I want that position. And I'm going to show you how hard I'm going to work to get that position. So there must be no doubt in your mind that I'm the one who is supposed to be playing. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course it makes sense. And you're like, I wanted to ask you, like, yeah. this, is, this might be a very ridiculous question to ask, you know, but like growing up, like uh, children generally want to be a maybe a forward or a striker or a midf midfielder because they get to score goals and and it's a sad fact that you know like the balland balland always goes to the person who scores goals. You don't get a keeper who gets yes. a balland So did you always want to be a keeper growing up or was it something that happened <laughs> during the co course of your career? Yes, I always wanted to be a goalkeeper. I was actually asked that just yesterday. Um, I always wanted to be a goalkeeper. Um, we got a lot of um, Serie A football um, in Trinidad back in the in, in the early nineties. Uh, we got a, we got some English football as well. And you know, I, I was a huge admirer of um, of Gianluigi Buffon. Um, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of Ray Clements uh, when he played. And there was just something about Ray Clements when he played. He had a he played in a green goalkeeping kit. So he had a green top and white shorts. 
And I remember looking at it as, as a child and I'm like, oh, I love how he looks. I love that kit. And I just fell in love with it. And from that day, I just always wanted to be a goalkeeper. Always wanted to be a goalkeeper. Of course, and you're like, uh, staying with the same team, you have travelled a lot, you know, doing your playing career, many clubs in many different countries. So, you know, like, as a keeper, how different were the cultures? You know, like, uh, because uh, you would have experienced maybe in some places, they like to play out from the back, some play long. How were the different cultures, you know, like in different teams that you have played? I um, mean, yeah, it, it, it all depends on what the coach's philosophy is, you know, how the coach wants to play. There's some coaches, they, they want to try to play out from the back. There's some coaches, they would give me a clear instruction. We're not playing out at the back. I want you to kick it every time you have it. So, and at, at the end of the day, you follow the coach's instructions. You do follow the coach's instructions. There's some coaches, they, they insist they, need, they want to play it out at the back. So, it, it's, it's, it's about you also being able to adapt as a goalkeeper um, to whatever the coach's wishes are. And um, I think that's also a good sign of a, of, of a good player, if you're able to adapt to what the coaches coach wants. Of course, like, I wanted to ask you, like, when you started your career, the, 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 maybe the simple uh, fact of you know, like playing out from the back was not that fashionable as it was maybe towards the end of your career. So like, did, you, did you find it difficult to maybe shift your game like that or was it something that came across easily? Um, I was quite lucky because my coach um, in Trinidad all those years ago, I think he was before his time because he always insisted on goalkeepers doing technical stuff with your feet. Um, so from a young doing all the technical drills that, that old field players do. So when that back pass rule came in, it was almost um, it was almost a seamless process, you know, for me to to, to, to get into it, 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 I'm not saying it was easy because it was still different because you, you were used to picking the ball up when a ball is played back to you. But because he was so, um, he was so thorough in the way he coached us, we were, you know, I, I was able to adapt quite quickly to that back pass rule. Of course, I have this basic doubt, okay, like what is a big fuss about Goal, goalkeepers being able to pass like that isn't that a basic criteria of playing football like passing a ball exactly exactly and it is a basic criteria and it did if you if you go back in time you would you would see over you know over the years you would see international goalkeepers back then before the back pass rule came out there were some goalkeepers um that were already good with their feet you know one that comes to mind is the, the dutch goalkeeper from 1978 he was good with his feet. Brazil's goalkeeper in 1986, Carlos, he was very good with his feet. So there were goalkeepers, you know, even back in the day, who they looked comfortable on the ball when the ball was played back to them. And um, yeah, so, so although some goalkeepers struggled to adapt it, there were, there were a few who were already um, prepared to deal with that. Of course, I mean, like I'll get back to one of the highlights maybe of your career. You were the first choice keeper when Trinidad and Tobago reached the World Cup in 2006. But unfortunately, due to injury, you could not play much like how, how you hoped for. How did you feel? Because you know, that's like a dream for many people, you know, like to reach there. Although you played, you would have maybe been involved more had the injury not happened. How did you feel? How, what, is your, uh, how, what, what is going on in your mind? Um, you know, it, it was a very difficult moment, very, very difficult moment. And more so, obviously, you know, I was, I was the number one keeper. Um, but it happened about 10 days before the first game. Um, seven to 10 days before the first game it happened, I, you know, I, I, I picked up a calf injury. And, um, you know, the, the medical team, they worked very, very hard. We worked very hard to get me back fit. Um, the day before the game, two days before the game, I declared myself fit because I was able to train. Um, I trained before the game, the day before the game, the night before the game, and um, I felt all right, no problems at all. And then on the day of the game, um, while warming up, I could actually feel my calf really tighten. And I thought it was something that I'll be able to shake off, 
Um, so I continued my warm up and, and what have you, and then I realized that you know there's no way I, I, I could play. And um, at that point, I'll be honest, I was devastated, absolutely devastated, because um, you work all your life for this, um, you make so many sacrifices in your life, um, and then I was not in a position to play, and it it, it was a difficult decision to go to the coach at the time leo bin hacker and tell him that you know i can't play and you know you know he asked me a few times are you sure are you sure kelvin and i said to him yes i'm sure um the team comes first um and it would be very selfish of me to try to play um just for playing sake and i let the team down i let the country down i let myself down my family down and um i made a tough decision to you know to you know, to, to pull out of the game. Um, so, yeah, that's how that went, you know. And, um, you know, fortunately, um, again, we kept working on the injury, kept working on the injury. And, you know, fortunately, I was able to come back for the last game um, against Paraguay. Of course, and your, your loss was maybe Shaka's gain. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Shaka is a good pro. Shaka is a good pro. Um in all honesty, it couldn't happen to someone who would have been more um, prepared because, you know, Shaka, he, he, he was a very experienced goalkeeper. He was a very good goalkeeper. And, um, you know, it, he was the perfect player for that situation at the last moment coming in to do a job. And he did a fantastic job. Of course, you know, like I wanted to ask one more on that same topic. Like, you know, Trinidad and Tobago have not fared maybe that well since then in terms of maybe qualification for world cup and since you are also in uh, uh, in various capacities with the national team what what do you think is going wrong or what is not happening what is not clicking for them um, there are a number of issues um that's that that are, that is happening right now that um we need to sort out um there's a there's right now there's a an issue between the the federation and fifa um, FIFA appointed a normalization committee and that needs sorting out um, sooner rather than later because we have World Cup qualifiers um, beginning in October. So that needs to be sorted out sooner rather than later because we need to prepare for that. Um, but um, also we need to, to have some serenity in terms of the leadership of the, of the Federation. We need a few years where we have the right people in, in place who really want to develop football, who um, who have that, that ambition for us to always be competitive all the time. We need that. That is something we desperately need because the talent is there. But in terms of putting together the infrastructure and organizing stuff, that is where we are falling short. In, in 2006, we were quite lucky because we had quite a few players who were playing at a high level so we had Dwight York. We had about 15 of us was playing in the UK. So most of our team was so experienced that the manager, when he came in, he just had to put the puzzle together, right? Because we were so experienced and a few of us, we were involved in previous campaigns, previous World Cup campaigns. So, you know, he came in and he was brilliant, Leo Bin Hacker. Um, he was, you know, he's an experienced coach. He, he coached Holland in the 1990 World Cup. He was also Real Madrid's manager in 1990 is it 93 1993 i think it was he was real madrid's manager as well so he is quite, he was quite experienced um he's dealt with big players and um he came and he organized us and um yeah the rest was history and it still wasn't easy because we needed a playoff against bahrain to qualify of course and you like uh, going forward like what do you think like of course you said you require a lot of sorting out and of course that that is, that is easier said than done in any in any country anything is very easy to say than is than getting it done realistically what should uh, trinidad and tobago you know like look look into in the next few years like should it be like building the huge structure or something so that the next campaign goes in or is it something that they can qualify they can aim to qualify for the next world cup itself I believe every country you should have short, medium, and long-term goals. All right. So your short-term goals should always be to try to um, to win football matches, especially at the senior level. 
to try to win football matches. But when you go lower down the, 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 the pyramid, right, with the youth teams, it needs to be about development. So whether it is the whole club structure, the professional game, um, the leagues and what have you, the focus must be on those young players with an eye 10 years later, where are these young players going to be? So where are the, the, the 13 and 14 year olds going to be in 10 years time? So it must be a methodical process to develop these players. Um, it's not easy because every country is working hard to try to do that. So it's not going to be easy. But if you're con consistent doing it, you have a chance of being successful. But you need that consistency. You need good coaches. That's crucial. You need good coaches, especially at the young age group. You need top coaches there because what do those top those young players they are learning the basics of the game and the basics of that of the game is what is going to take them to the next level if the, if, if that makes sense so yeah we, we we need to focus in the long term on the young players and really developing them technically and tactically but immediately the senior national team which is a flagship team you have to try to get results. You also have to try to get results. Of course, and you know, like uh, uh, the base, the base of a good nation would be how the league is. You know, like how is the national league? And like, I do not know much about uh, how how the Trinidad and Tobago football is. How is the league there? How is the national league that's uh, being played there? How what is the quality? Um, I I played in the league when it just started up. This this would have been you know back in. In um, you know, 2000, uh, you know, 1999, 2000, around there, and it, it was it was a, a decent enough league then. Right now, the league is is not very good because they've had a lot of financial problems um in the league. So that's also an issue that we need a good league up and running to become competitive again. Um, that's going to take time. That's going to take time because you need sponsorship, sponsorship as well. You need um, private companies getting on board. You need good support from government to get football going again, to really get money into football so we could have a good, strong league which players could play in. Of course, and you're like, uh, again, another, uh, I have another weird question. Okay? It's like, you see, like, in football, you don't see goalkeepers become a... Head coach, you know, like I've never seen a goalkeeper become a head coach. Why is that so? Um, it, and it's something that frustrates me. I'll, I'll, and I'll be honest with you, it does frustrate me because a lot of people don't realize that I'm, I'm also a very good coach. Um, they don't realize that. There are few people um, who know that, you, you know, obviously the, the, the Trinidad and Tobago national coach, Terry Fennick, um, I played under him. He, um, he knows my coaching ability as well not only with goalkeepers with with players so he knows that hence the reason why he, he got me involved um you know with the national team setup um but you know we you know dino zoff was a goalkeeper he he managed italy as well he managed lazio um um wolves manager right now nuno espirito santo he was a goalkeeper he he played for portugal he played for for porto he was a goalkeeper um, but you're right. Not many goalkeepers, um, you know, make that step into management. Um, I definitely want to make that step into management. That's that's a huge ambition of mine, um, and uh, I believe it will happen. I believe it will happen. Um, but um, in the meantime, it's about educating yourself about the game. Um, you know, learning, watching a game. You know, having an analytical eye. You know, towards the game analyzing players you know looking at different coaching methods observing what coaches do now um yeah just always having that that ability to 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 be humble and learn yeah be humble and be prepared to you know take a bit here take a bit there and then you put your own package together to develop to, to deliver to players of course and i just as an outsider i just have one doubt which i'll ask you is it like generally you see keepers training as a unit like you have the uh, maybe the first second third keeper training together with the goalkeeper coach 
and maybe a little uh, aside from maybe the main team is that a reason because they are not so much exposed to maybe the main team on a day to day basis that they do not go into coaching is it something on that line is, is, does that affect you mean that goalkeepers train alone yeah yeah um well with goalkeeping goalkeeping is a real specific um position to, that needs specific training um and it's a it's a position as well that has that is neglected the world over because it, you know just with my observations with with going around the world as well i've i've realized that goalkeepers they are so neglected they're usually just put into a corner and say okay you guys do whatever you need to do and then you call them in when you want to do shooting or you want to get into a game um but to become a good quality goalkeeper you need specific work you need a lot of technical work um you know to to develop yourself um so that's why goalkeepers train spend a lot of time together in a corner doing specific work specific drills um which would prepare them to be effective in a match of course like you said like you require uh, the set of skills that is uh, for keeper and you need to hone that skills over time do you think like because you train a side as a group and maybe do not spend much time with the main team is that does that affect maybe in the long term you know like when a goalkeeper wants to be a coach he does not have the experience maybe of that day to day of the main team does that affect or is it just something that i am making it up or some illusion in in fact to the contrary because when it says you look at a goalkeeper when you look at a goalkeeper right a goalkeeper has the perfect view of a football pitch when you're playing and then, and that is that is something i learned at, you know when i was playing that your view you have the perfect view so you could actually see something that's going to happen long before it happens you're also in a position in which you could tell people the right tactical position to be in if if that makes sense so you're able to tell whether it is your your one of your midfielders left shoulder right shoulder be aware open your body you know you know look over your shoulder there are so many different things so many angles you have as a goalkeeper that you're able to 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 see the game in a real tactical way so that's why it's such a surprise that um you know more goalkeepers have not have not been you know or decided to become coaches because your view is perfect to to analyze the game of course and uh, the only reason i brought up that was because i have not on a personal note i have not seen many keepers so you know like uh, i'll i'll move on move on from that topic and maybe the next question might be difficult you have played for quite a few clubs but if you had to choose one place where you enjoyed your time the most which one would that be um i would i would say in trinidad i would just say playing in trinidad was 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 the place i i enjoyed myself best um you know just because you're playing at home you're playing with um you know some of your childhood friends um you know you you you're in your own comfort zone as well um i i would never forget you know the, those early days in 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 my football career you know just playing at home playing in trinidad um i also enjoyed you know playing up in dundee i, I do like um i always tell people how how good it was up in scotland i just think Scot- scottish people are so warm they're so welcoming um so i really really enjoyed that um and um yeah i, I would say those two places were you know where i really enjoyed um you know playing football of course and you like uh, you know you'd have lot of coaches in your career but do you have any particular coach who had the most influence on you as a player um yeah the the, the, the person on the most influence on me as a player was um someone called Arthur Brown um he was my coach in Trinidad and he um you know that that's the guy who I said I think he was way beyond his years you know when he insisted that we able to we that we able to to play with our feet as well you know I'm talking back in you know in the 1980s he was you know he was insisting on on that you know early 1990s so um you know Arthur Brown I would say he you know he had a massive part to play in my in my career he was a fantastic coach and I was very lucky to have him as a as a child you know to 
you know, to learn so much from him. And we would sit and we would talk for hours and hours and hours about the game and analyze games. And um, yeah, he was brilliant. Um, I would also say, um, you know, people like Terry Fennick, um, the, the present national team national team manager. He um, he came to Trinidad, and you know, he was my manager at club level in Trinidad, and I learned quite a bit from him. Um, you know, you know, really about professionalism and, and um, you know, the, the, the tactical side as well, being organized. Um, and of course, Leo Bean Hacker, who was our, you know, national team manager when we qualified, he, he was at a different level. Um, you know, he was so knowledgeable. He, um, you know, and of course, you know, when, you know, he managed people like Hugo Sanchez and Rude Hullet and Frank Reichardt and Marco Van Basten. So when you manage those type of players and, um, you know, he was, when he's imparting his knowledge to us, I paid attention because I always knew that I wanted to get into coaching. So I would, I would even ask him questions after. I would be asking him loads of questions. Um, he probably thought I was a bit irritating, but um, I, I just wanted to learn as much as I could from him. Because I wanted to be able to, when I decided to get into coaching, that I'll be fully prepared. Of course, and you're like, uh, the next question is a little bit lighter. Were you a superstitious person as a player? Like, did you follow some match routine before games? Yes, I did. Um, yes, I did. Um, I would always try to sit to the front of the bus. Um, so, the, the I, I never like going to the back of the bus so it must be not in the middle either it must be somewhere to the front of the bus by a window it must be by a window as well and um just because i had a ritual of, of praying before a game so i'll just lean my head against the window and i'll be praying um you know before a game um that that was my my ritual and if i wasn't able to do that um i, I felt as though i did not prepare well so I would try to do that. If I was driving to a game, right, I would um, I would do the same thing in my car. I'll be driving and I'll actually put my head against my window like this and, and be praying. And, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but um, yeah, that is just what made me feel comfortable. It made me feel complete to go out and play. Of course, and you're like... Uh... The next next question is a little bit hypothetical. And if you had the chance to play with any player in the history of football, whom would you have liked to have played with? Oh, that's an unbelievable question. That's a great question. Um, who would I have wanted to play with? There are so many. There are so many. Um, it could be Ronaldinho. Right, it could be Ronaldinho because I've actually played against Ronaldinho when we played Brazil back in 2000 in a in a in a friendly um, Olympic friendly. So it could be Ronaldinho, um, just because he was just a magical player. He he put two penalties past me when we played that game, but um, playing with him, I think, would have been a dream come true. Just looking at what he did with a football. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a goalkeeper, but you have to admire when someone is just technically perfect, you know, like he was. Um, you know, he's probably the one player I would have, you know, really wanted to play with. I wish he was my teammate. Of course, and many of them would have had that uh, choice, I guess, because he was really magical. Of course. Of course, yeah. You know, they you know, there 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 are few players. You know that there are few players that you you look at and you you just have to admire. Um, Ronaldinho is certainly one, certainly one. Ronaldinho. Um, you know, people like um, Ronaldo, the, the Brazilian Ronaldo. You know, he he's another who you would look at and you you would just do anything to share a football football pitch with them. And you know, if you if you're their teammate, you you know you would just be ecstatic you know with, with they being their teammates you could just sit back and just watch them do their magic and just do your best to keep everything out of the net you know um but yeah so you know like uh, i'll move on from then you know like you started your playing career in early 1990s and 
and uh, you know like football was very different back then and now you are also coaching in your opinion how has the game evolved in that period um the, the game has gotten quicker the game I, I believe is a little bit quicker and the, the the main the main difference right now i think players look after themselves better now um compared to back in the, in those days so in the early 90s um yes players were fit they were in good shape but now there's such a scientific approach to it with the way um players are looked after um the top top players they never really lose fitness you know you you're playing for 10 11 months a year even when you go in your off season um because you know the level that you're going to be expected to 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 be at when you return you don't really stop training you may take maybe two or three days off but you do something every day to keep ticking over to keep st- to stay fit and to make sure as well that you put the right things in your body um to eat the right foods um you know you stay away from only fatty foods and what have you because competition is so fierce that you cannot take any any chance at all um you, you must look after yourself if you don't look after yourself you've got no chance in today's game no chance whatsoever even at the lower levels you know here in england even if you're talking about national league league 2 league 1 championship the players are quite professional now and they look after themselves they report to pre-season and they they already in shape which 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 is already good for the managers you know, because you could start playing pre-season games you know straight away so um i think that's the main difference from players back in the 90s to players now of course and you know like now we are coming to the end and i'll ask you two more questions and the first one of the two is if you had to choose one moment from your career you know which is the most stand out moment which will be very difficult but which is the most stand out moment from your career which one would that be um most important moment of my career i would have to say one my first football match when i was only uh 9 years old i could still remember it to this day um i couldn't touch the crossbar or anything like that um but i remember it to this day um you know that first football match i played for my primary school crew at anglican primary school so uh, that would always you know be with me and of course when we are uh, when we qualified for the world cup in 2006 um you know that second game against bahrain in 2005 it it was a it was a high pressure game it was um you know because you have to, you know the expectation was huge um everyone back home expected us to go over there and get the job done so you know the, there was huge pressure but you know pressure is something i really do like pressure is something that um helps me to remain focused so i i actually like being under pressure I like feeling that that um that expectation um i like the i like having that chance where you could fail right because because you could fail you want to make sure you don't fail so that makes you even more thorough that makes you even more professional that makes you even more motivated more disciplined more committed um so yeah so that you know that was a game that um you know I, i would say that um really defined you know what um you know what my ambitions were of course and you know like uh, the, the last question that I would, uh, that i will ask you is you know since you have so much experience you have traveled a lot in terms of football and if you had to give a piece of advice to a young player starting out what advice would you give that player um to make it in in football or in any sport at the top level you have to be totally committed you must be totally committed to that sport and that would mean upsetting people as well and when i say upsetting people you have to have almost a tunnel vision you know like you would see those race horses and they wear and blinkers and they just focused on running straight ahead you have to have that same mentality you have to have that goal and you have to tick off all the boxes that comes in trying to get to that goal so you've got to be committed you've got to be disciplined you've got to work hard you've got to be humble 
And if you do those things, you've got a good chance of being successful. And of course, you have to have the talent, but the talent is only 10%. Your, your, your God-given ability, that's only 10% of what you need to, to make it at, at, at the top level. The rest is discipline, commitment, humility. Those are the other things that you need to get up to the next level. Of course, and you know, like on that note, I'll ask, I'll sneak in one more question. If you had to choose one of these two, whom would you choose, Ronaldo or Messi? Leo Messi. Leo Messi, without question. Without question. The Lionel Messi, you know, you know, people talk about he has to go and play for another team to be considered the greatest of all time because Cristiano, he has gone from Real Manchester United to Real Madrid, then to Juventus. And people say Messi has only been in um, in Barcelona. But Pele only played for Santos. Yeah, he only played for Santos. And he only went to New York Cosmos in, in the back end, you know, when he had more or less retired. Yeah. So, but what Lionel Messi has done against every opposition from every country, there is no doubt about that. It doesn't matter if he plays teams from the Premier League, he plays teams from um, the Bundesliga, he plays teams from, from Portugal, wherever. Where, whoever he's played against, he's been out of this world. And his statistics, if we want to judge it by statistics, when you compare Messi's statistics to Cristiano's statistics, he is superior. He is superior without, without a doubt. And then he has that that naturalness about him. He, you know, he's five foot six, five foot seven, and he's able to keep people off. His, you know, he's got a remarkable touch. But what sets him apart, in my opinion, to Cristiano, his decision making. It is very, very rare to see Lionel Messi make the wrong decision. He always makes the right decision. Of course, and you're like, uh, on that note, Kelvin, thank you so much for talking to me and I wish you all the best for your future campaigns, you know, as a coach, wherever that is. And uh, I wish you all the best for that. And thank you once again for coming. Hope we can talk in soon. Take care, stay safe. Bye. Okay, bye. See you later. See you.